So here we are now sitting with one of the headliners at this grooving 2019 in New York City. David, the legendary Radigan. Wow, what a pleasure it is to have him on our camera right here on stage. Sir, so good to see you. Wow. Well, I should be on a stool with his back <laughs> drop. Oh, wow. And you on a stool. <laughs> Down in Jamaica, in your own private studios. Had I known you were, you were going to be here, David, this evening, I would have, I would have you don't arranged. You mocked, mocked it up. So, you course, don't know mock up. Of course, we'll get it done, man. I'm a big fan of the show. Yes. And I watch it because I'm an avid fan of the music. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you keep up with it. I try my best to keep up, but you're, I mean, David. no, I'm serious because the thing about the music is it's developing so fast mm -hmm. and this new generation rightly is coming through in the way that the Scatterlights was a new generation and, and the Melodians were a new generation and Bob was a new, so we have to have this movement, without it we're lost and there's a new generation coming through and the music they're making is music for themselves because the thing, uh, elders say to me, oh I can't take the music, I don't understand the music, I don't understand some of it and I don't get mm -hmm. some of it. But what I say to people is, well, if you're not getting it, it's probably not for you. Right. You know, because they're yeah. making it for themselves. And that's the thing about the world in which we live. It's moving so fast and people are making so much music. And I'm thinking, how does Wimpy keep up? Because you're up to speed with everything. I mean, <laughs> if it's happening, you've got the money. Mind you, you have an advantage. You live in Jamaica and you're a Jamaican. Well, yes, we got to escape it. Yes. Kingston, the, the heartbeat. Kingston, yeah. the heartbeat yeah. is, is always in our ears, you know, everywhere you go. But the last time you were in Kingston, mm. you were rocking kids, <laughs> David. You kids were so. I don't think you need to do anything with them play, playing your good old music, David. Well, I tell you, I feel thrilled and honoured to be on a bill as a lineup with this. Yes. Such a lineup as Grooving in the Park. You're talking about Sizzler Kalunji, Beris Hammond, Third World, and um, and Michael Bolton, and and there's a DJ on a lineup. And I was like, well, they've actually got me billed. Um, and, what, what, um, and what I've been told by the promoters, the, the Groove in the Park team is, yep, that's how you're billed because we want you to do what you do, yes. which is play your music and talk about it. And I'm, so look, I, I'm looking forward to that. That, David, that demo in the park, and it's wide, very wide. Have you done any research on it? I have. It's very wide. Oh, it's vast. It's and everybody, yes, family. Yes, kids, you know. mom, dad, grannies, uncles. It's, it's a real cross-section of society, and they're all there for one thing, the music and the vibe. And I have no doubt in my mind that you'll rock that place. I'm, I can't wait to see it. The Dub Garden. Here's this guy talking about can't keep him. Have you, have you looked at him live, when he's live, <laughs> playing records? No guy, no youngster is better with uh, exerting more energy than you did. The energy... You're, you're I, jumping, it, you're moving, you're, you are making people dance by just looking at you. <laughs> but I've always, I can't help myself. You know when you love something so much? Yes. You really love it? It's like to be given the privilege to share it. Yes. I remember as a youth, hanging out my bedroom window to see if anyone was listening to my Derek Morgan records. And that was in 66 and 67. I always wanted to turn people on mm -hmm. to something that I thought was so special. And of course, in those days, it was completely new. This whole Jamaican mm -hmm. music movement, this is what I say time and time and time and time again. Jamaica's, Jamaicans watching this show now in Jamaica on Jamaican television need to know this, that the music of this island, and I am not patronizing you, yes. and I'm not patronizing you, but the music of Jamaica is revered around the world. I think Jamaicans who perhaps haven't been to Japan or America are not perhaps up to speed with the fact that this music has had a major impact on world music, from dub, from mixes, from remixes, before house, before hip hop, before techno. This music was there in the format that came with Jamaica independence, the incredible energy of these iconic figures, you know, like the Wailers. Bunny Wailers' Black Heart Man, one of the greatest albums of all time. Bob Andy's, the Songbook album at Studio One, all these magnificent recordings, Prince Buster. I mean, the list is long. I mean, you're talking about putting any of these names on a headline bill in London or New York two, three decades ago. You're talking about complete and utter sell-out roadblock. This is the power and the impact that the music of your country has had on the world. That is a fact, and I've said it. Do you think we know it enough? I don't we think... We Jamaicans. Uh, well, I think... I think you probably do to an extent, but I think you, 
I'm proud to tell you, I'm proud to say, because I've seen it, I've been in Italy, I've been in Switzerland, I've played to these audiences, and I've seen these great artists perform in those countries when I've been on festivals, and I've seen the impact. Go, I mean, just go to Benny Kassim, go to Rotterdam Festival, the yes. Rotterdam Sunsplash Festival in Spain. Go, go to- Summer Jam. Go to Summer Jam in Germany. Mm -hmm. There you're going to see it. Yeah. There you're going to see the impact of your music, of Jamaican music. What is it, David? What is it that is, what is it about reggae? What, what is it about the music that got you, that got the world? The impact of the music that got the world, ska and especially reggae, was the message, the passion and the melodies. Those three things mixed together, those unique voices. I'm a sucker for a melody. I love a melody. Mm -hmm. You take a group like the Melodians and listen to what they did. You take the raw, brusque style of Toots and the Maytals. Listen to the Wailers and those early recordings. The beauty and majesty was in the songs and the melodies. These haunting arrangements, these great horn arrangements. You know, Bob Andy's I've Got to Go Back Home is just one example. I played that at the Dub Garden um, last year in Jamaica. And everyone, -da 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 I've got to go back home. <laughs> and at the bridge, everyone sings the horns. Mm -hmm. This is a reflection of why the music is so important. And also the music stood up for injustice. It stood up for people who were in sufferation because it spoke man to man, woman to woman about what people were having to endure. Mm -hmm. And this music is a great release. You know, it, it, it lifts people's souls. It gives people solace and comfort. It, it gives people hope. And that's what it did. That's what the music has done. And that's why when people hear it in other countries, even if they don't understand it, they get it. There's something within the music which strikes a chord in the heart and soul of people. And once you get that reggae fever, there is no known antidote. It is infectious. It is a passion. So we, the youngsters in Jamaica now, uh, I call Jamaica the hatchery of, of reggae. Um, with them doing dance on, onto it, and um, and they're more passionate in some respects uh, about it than they are about reggae. Even yes. though we there, are, there's a, there is a new generation we call the new roots, the yes. chronics and those guys. Yes. Are we then um, distracted? from what, why the world wants us, why do, is the world still interested in that, in the melody and the, and the, 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 um, the harmony and the, the messages of love and, and upliftment and, um, and equal rights and justice and those things. The world is distracted by what's happening. There's no two ways about it. Yes. People have told me this time and time again, what has happened to the origins of the music? What has happened to this new format of music? Mm -hmm. And it has impacted, and I say it openly, without fear or favor, because it's the truth. And what I say in, in, by way of reflecting it and trying to understand it, because I think the important thing in life is always to try, if you don't understand something, you don't know about something, you have to try and get your head around it. Why is it happening? Can we, as someone once said, walk a mile in that man's yes. shoes, to understand why this is happening? We may not understand why these young musicians are making the music they make within the dance or genre. One of the observations I would make about some of the beats they're creating is they don't have the impact of 80s and 90s dance. Or. Now, what we've seen is this incredible eruption of Afro beats. The Afro beat thing has been a phenomena, truly incredible. It has blazed a trail across Africa into Europe and now into America. You know, I was hearing Afro beats on the radio downtown in Manhattan today. So what does that tell you? That's telling you that there was once a time when Afro music wasn't as popular as it is now. But one of the observations and one of the criticisms leveled at, at Jamaican, at the new wave of Jamaican dance or music is the beats and the production are not as heavy and as fat and as juicy. They don't drop in the way that a Steely and Cleavy beat did or a Dave Kelly. This is one of the observations. But the, the fact of the matter is that these young producers are making the music that they want to make for their peer group. And unless you get your head around that, it's difficult. I also think that anything that glorifies violence in, an, in, a, in a negative way has no serious purpose. It, it's like, okay, then people say, oh, why do you go and, go and watch a gangster movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I take that point. 
But if there's a genuine glorification of it, in other words, that this is something we should be doing or something, a, a kind of gang, then I, I question that because as an avid fan of the music, that's not what attracted me to the music. What attracted me to the music was upliftment. This music uplifted people. If you're going to put people down in a hole and make them seek out a life which is negative and vacuous, then you're inviting something into your community which is negative, which serves no use or purpose. And I, we have to question why. What's the, what's the use of that? I often say to them, the world would look to Jamaica if they want to buy violence or want to know how to kill people. Jamaica wouldn't be the place to look for ways to do that. No. Because there are people in the world, there are countries in the world that can do that way Oh, I, I could not agree more. I okay. could not agree more. It's happening now in the Yemen. Yes. You know, people, I mean, wars, wars, weapons of war. Not rumors of war, but w war. Yes, I agree. And so Jamaica was the opposite to that. Jamaica, the music, as you've said, was about love, harmony, love coming out of poverty. Uh, yes. I mean, got yes. the world, yes. isn't it? Yes, of course, Winford. Of course. So they don't want it for anything else. That's and, what and they the, want. That's and, what the world wants and, from Jamaica. And if you look at the big records right now, coffee, right? You oh, coffee. stop there. There is one glittering, gleaming, shining example mm -hmm. of how a young 18, 19 year old student, young girl, becoming a woman who has taken the music and turned it upside down. Mm -hmm. Her tone, her ability, she can sing too, but her rapping style, the melody and the message, blessings fall on my right hand, mm -hmm. gratitude is a must. Yeah. And Winford, this is being played on Hot 97 in New York, where we are, mm -hmm. daytime high rotation. It's being played on BBC Radio 1 on daytime rotation. Mm -hmm. And she's just done a combination with Ed Sheeran, mm -hmm. Justin Bieber and Chronix on yeah. a remix of Ed's new single. What does that tell you? She's burning up the world. Of course she We're is. We're coming from Kenya last week. Kenya. You're in Kenya? Nairobi. And oh, when, okay. they put, when they drop those, that record, ask him, that guy behind the camera. Rupert. The place. The place, boss up. Exploded. <laughs> David. Coffee. In, in Kenya. Kenya. Yeah. Salute. So, you know, so that's, the, that's the, the message that these kids, those who are doing violence, who believe that... You who know, are glorifying violence. Who are glorifying violence and believe that. And why are they, do you think they're looking at the world enough, uh, David? It, are they interested in the world or is it just their little environment back home? It would seem, to be, it would seem to be their environment back home. Um, this teenage thing, and we've got this horrendous horror that's happening in our communities, England, where young people are stabbing each other yes. every day. I mean, this is a, an epidemic in England. Young people, on a weekly, sometimes daily basis, are trying to stab each other to death. 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 18-year-olds, dropping in the street for nothing. That is a glorification of violence. When you have people living in fear, you're living in a horrible world. If you can't go to bed at night and lay down on your pillow and give thanks for a day and know that tomorrow you have a day of hope and, and, and then you are going to live in fear, then that's a terrible thing. And I don't understand it, but it is prevalent. It has become more prevalent in teenage society in our major cities, especially in London. And I see it and I hear it in some of the music that's being made. What does it achieve, in my opinion? Well, it clearly achieves nothing other than it causes death. But if we, re if we reflect it to Jamaica and look at Jamaica, it's that, that gang culture, that group culture, that I don't have anyone but I've got my gang so I've got safety and I've got power and I'm empowered by the people I move with. And one of the issues of course is all to do with the development of a young person. You know, what they go through, the changes they go through mm -hmm. um, from boyhood to manhood and all that comes with it. And we're living in a world now where more and more, it seems to me, people are being obsessed with social media. I mean, okay, social media is incredibly important in that it, we can communicate with each other. But now it's reached a stage where you're in a dance and people are filming themselves in the dance, dancing. And you think, 
uh, where's this gone to? You look to it for everything. Yeah, and of course the whole thing of filming something instead of watching something. You know, I saw Bob Marley, Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler in a pub in London in Fulham in 19, uh, 1974. I'll never forget the performance. I didn't need a camera to remind me, it's still in my head. I think sometimes we have to remember that we do have brains, we do have memories, and we do have recall. And so we can, I know people want to capture everything, but sometimes the, the photograph simply doesn't capture. Uh, it, it is merely a moment in time, but the experience itself is vital. And that's why, that's why I think sometimes we're, we're too dependent on, on, on what somebody else is doing, how many likes somebody has, am I as popular as, am I too fat? Um, this body obsessive thing and how I saw your program about body enhancement I was very interesting um, on stage time that you did that show uh, because that's another concern yes. you know young especially with young girls they're concerned that they, they've lost con they, they lose confidence in themselves it's a terrible thing but young people growing up need help and encouragement they need a positive attitude and if you're saying that the best thing they can do is be down with it with the whole culture of hating and the whole gang culture it's just it's insane um, I don't understand it because I, I don't live in it um, and I, I didn't when I grew up uh, I certainly wasn't in a gang I chose not to be I think the greatest conviction I think the greatest thing young people can do is to stick to their own truth and and I think it's very important and this may sound a bit cheesy and it may sound a bit corny but my god listen to your mother and listen to your father and honor your mother and father because I know that as the years have ticked by the things my parents taught me have resonated with me as I've become a man. I think it's very, very important to listen and learn. know that this mysterious man is actually the notorious sound system serial killer David Rodigan. Where's our music in the UK right now? We credit the UK for breaking reggae in the world, to the world. You're the historian. Migrant Jamaicans took it before the artists, some of those wind Correct. Rocks, and they were playing it in their basement. Absolutely. Isn't that how you guys got onto it? That's exactly how I got onto it. Okay. And then later on, you love it so much, you wanted to see the artists come and perform. Yes. The British people have, since that, been pushing the music, consuming it. Yes. And when they say yes to a record, it is likely, like um, coffee now. Yeah. Coffee is burning up the world. Yeah. Because you guys added her to your playlist. Yes. So High list, A list rotation. Don't the world look to you for guidance in popular music? I think the world has always looked to the UK because some of the greatest bands have come Including out of the UK. Including the great United States, right? Yes, because the Beatles took America by storm. Yes. You know, prior to them, it was Elvis and a, and a rock and roll movement. But when the Beatles and the Rolling Stones came along, um, there was a big explosion of British culture that hit America. So yes, the 60s are a very important time. I was fortunate enough to be a teenager growing up. I saw Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. I saw him at Aylesbury Town Hall. You know, I saw these, some of these bands, not all of them. So we were there when that movement was happening and young working class kids who were not Jamaican, uh, they were white urban kids from London, major cities, they took this sound of reggae 50 years ago mm -hmm. in 1969 and they made it their own. How did they make it their own? They went out and bought it in bucket loads. Box after box of these records were being sold, not in traditional West Indian shops, but in pop record shops. So these chart returns are being made. Oh, the pioneers, look at them, Dave and Ansel Collins. Oh, and the Melodians, oh, Pat Kelly. These records were selling hundreds of thousands and they went in the British charts. So young British youths took new, the music, the skinheads and the mods before them, took the music of Jamaica and took it onto themselves. The West Indian culture was there, obviously it's part of what, what, was, what was growing and developing in England, and they had their blues parties and their shubins and their dances and their clubs and their sound systems, and we can't forget the importance of sound systems. But that was, that was also happening, but the, what was also happening was that this reggae music was being played on Radio One. I was hearing reggae music played on pirate ships oh. in the North Sea of England. Okay. That's how important the music of Jamaica was then, and it, and it, and it, and it it, it captured the hearts, souls and imagination of British people and everyone, I, I defy anyone to say 
they don't know a reggae, you know, half a dozen reggae hits. That is why the, the question is so important, David, about where the music is now. It isn't where it once was, and the reason for that is that the young black youth movement has not recreated the music that we know as reggae or dancehall. They have created their own music, which they call grime, or their own version of hip hop, or rather art R&B. Grime music, epitomized by artists such as Storms who's headlining at the, at the Glastonbury Music Festival this weekend, is a reflection of what has now happened in England. And this is not just black youths. If you watch Stormzy or some of the other gigs performing at these festivals, you're not seeing thousands and thousands of black people. You're seeing a mixture of people. And in the countryside, in the, in the home counties and some of the counties around the country, you're seeing a predominantly white audience who know every single lyric of these artists' songs. So these artists are the sons and daughters of Jamaicans, of Africans, of Barbasians, who've had a West Indian connection and an African connection. But they are not recreating African music as such. They're certainly not recreating dance or, or reggae because they, they are just not. And if you ask them, oh, do you like reggae? Um, well, I like a bit of dance or, uh, do, do you like reggae? Um, no, but my mum does. <laughs> and that's something that you get now, my mum does. The harder they come, that film alone, the soundtrack, introduced millions of people to this music. You can play Desmond Decker or any track from that soundtrack and it will resonate. But it, hasn't, it doesn't have the esteem that it once had simply because there aren't as many bands from Jamaica making the music that they once made. There, there are less of what we would call traditional reggae bands. I mean, there are few, there are only a few reggae bands now compared to what there once were and vocal harmony groups. And furthermore, the young people in England are not necessarily, um, they're not saying, oh, I want to recapture the essence like Aswad did, like Steel Pulse did. These were young British bands like UB40 did that, want, that loved reggae, took reggae and turned it upside down and made their own reggae. And there was so much of it. In the 70s and 80s, there were so many reggae bands. It was, so, it was a phenomenon. But now there are some college bands uh, that are making ska and, and reggae, of course. Gentlemen's Dub Club's a good example and there are others. But essentially what you've seen is a music which is no longer held in the esteem that it once was because it's not being recreated by British people in the way that it once was by young British blacks. That's what we've seen the demise of and that's where we are and that's a fact. Oh wow. That's a fact. You know David, well, it's quite a chat and we really, really appreciate you coming and, uh, and, and sharing with us and, and I'm happy that you can help me to make this point because maybe I'm not credible enough to to say to say to to youths because I don't know if it's resonating they, they they tend to to give some air to and eyeballs to us the show but I don't know if it's resonating when we tell them that the world don't want violence it no they don't want love no from, from they don't but we but where we're getting the love is I mean I saw on a rooftop here in Manhattan a couple of nights oh. ago I saw a young artist called Savannah and another artist called Leela Ike presented by Protégé, this, this lady, Savannah, is a phenomenal talent. I mean, she would lift the soul of anyone. She's, oh my God, she's incredible, as is Leela Ike. And these two artists, I mean, I was just talking today to the Iron Fist of New York, King Addis. They just finished voicing Leela Ike on dub plate. Protégé, Chronics, Kabaka Pyramid, you know, what the work of Damien Marley and his brother Stephen, of course, is, is incredible. Are creating their own space there? Yes, of course they are. Of yeah. course they are. No, so please don't misunderstand me when I said what I just said, yeah. because I, I don't say it in a vacuum. I say it as a reflection of what once was, mm -hmm. and I'm talking primarily in comparing what once was with what is now in terms of young people in England. But that's not to say that those same young people aren't captured and captivated by the new young roots music scene that's a, which we have discussed briefly at the beginning of this interview and which is very much a part of what's happening when we see you know Chronix is an incredible talent I mean really really on another level I had the privilege of interviewing him with the BBC three years ago and my producers we said the same thing it was like up on Jack's Hill we reasoned with him for about two hours and I came away thinking this is a young man Chronix is a young man 
but his understanding, his depth of understanding of humanity and culture, the impact of, and the thing I love about him is that he's not putting things in a box. So please don't get this wrong, Jamaica. Please understand, be quite clear about this, that the music of these new young artists is a phenomenon, and, and, and may there be more, and I'm certain there will be more coming through, because it is imperative. You cannot keep a good man or a good woman down. Talent will rise to the top like Cream does. Um, had a brief conversation with Leela Ike and Savannah afterwards. I was like, yes, we, we, there is, there is, we are, I mean, John 9. Look at John 9, look what she's doing. I mean, in a, in a wonderful, incredibly talented artist. And there has to be more, there will be more. This new movement of women in the business uh, is fantastic. Women. You know, and Jada yeah. Kingdom, what about her? Yeah. I mean, I saw her being interviewed on your show. She's an incredible talent. Mm -hmm. She jumped on a plane, played for herself to come up to England to perform at the One Extra Weekend in the East End of London, and she mashed the place up. Her blonde hair, her style, <laughs> her lyrics. I mean, oh, yeah. We're in a good place in many ways, and I hope I don't sound like I'm a downbeat, oh, it's not like it used to be. There's nothing more boring than saying people saying it's not like it used to be. It'll never be like it used to be, because that's not Absolutely. how the world evolves. It has to evolve, it will evolve, and it is important that we do not ever lose sight of the fact that without new talent, we're finished, and DJs have the responsibility to play new talent and let the songs breathe. I think we're living in a world now where some selectors seem to think that all people want to hear is 30 seconds of a song. That is not fair. It is not fair on the artistry. It is not fair on the musicians. It's not fair on the songwriters. It's not fair on the engineers who went to all this trouble to make something. And a selector comes on with a laptop and plays 30 seconds of the chorus looking for a cheap forward. That is killing the business. And I'm going to say this again and again and again, and I don't care who hates on me. This is killing the business. If a selector doesn't have the courage and the conviction to allow a song to breathe, at least to the chorus, at least to the bridge, and I, I appeal to selectors worldwide. Okay, maybe everyone doesn't want to hear the entire song from beginning to end, but my gosh, please do the music justice. Allow the music to breathe. If you don't have an engineer to record your song, if you don't have a singer to sing it, if you don't have a songwriter to write the song, if you don't have musicians to play the music, then nothing happens. Without the engineers, without the recording studios, without the artistry of sound and, and technicians and artistry of, of voice and DJs, people say, oh, it's just the DJs rapping over music. Yeah, you try and talk in rhyming couplets for two and a half minutes and keep time and not run out of lyrics. See if you can do that. It is an art form. But what are we doing, some of us? We're ripping the thing up. We're just shredding it. We are shredding it. We are not allowing to... And so many people say to me, boy, I can't go and dance again. They're already gone. Why can't? I can't take the squawking, the screaming, the hollering over the music. Watch me now. Yeah. All right, so there you have him, the big man, David Rodigan, on the state of reggae in the world at this time. Hope you learned something.